Hello, my name is Brian Heitzig. Bill Fluharty has asked me to participate in the project Resiliency of Latina Youth in the Grand Rapids area. And I'm also a designer and happen to have spent a lot of my career um, in the fuzzy front end of, of product development. And in that process, um, we explore lots of new things in depth in order to create new products and services. What he has asked of me for this project is to examine the concept of resilience. And more specifically, uh, do that in terms of analogies. And uh, analogies, I think, are very powerful storytelling tools for a couple of reasons. One is that they facilitate communication and they allow a bridging of our own viewpoints. They also are a way to describe things that don't exist yet and also are a great tool for um, inspiring uh, lateral thinking. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, in resilience per se, and I'm not necessarily a, a psychologist. Well, not necessarily. I am not a psychologist. Um, but I do have the capacity to examine issues, look at issues and in, in, in find commonalities and create frameworks and ways to uh, gather that information and depict it in ways that people can use um, for uh, this project. So one way to explore the idea of resilience is to um, talk about it in terms of what others consider to be resilient. And oftentimes resilience is talked about in terms of um, people being resilient. And the Holocaust is, I think, a, a really great example of that. People would look at these people as being very resilient. I think that's a, a fair assessment. And you know, there's also a lot of talk in terms of resilience being um, related to materials and the ability for balls to bounce back. And so if you look at this slide, you can see that not only does the, the ball squish a little bit when it contacts a tennis racket, but the tennis racket deflects and then ejects the ball back out. And so what you see here is this resilience in material objects and, and um, that sort of thing. It's non-living resilience. I think what's really interesting here is, is start to think about um, does that mean that uh, it's different than human resilience or resilience in living things? Um, a theory maybe is that anything non-organic may tend to be less resilient over time. So you start to think, well, then is human resilience the kind of a thing that improves with use? You know, a tennis ball bounces back a little bit less each time. So you know, the thought is that um, resilience in material objects gets less over time, organic resilience maybe improves over time. So you know, analogies we talked about um, as a way to inspire lateral thinking by making analog analogies between resilience and what we normally typically think resilience as to things that we might not typically consider resilient. You know, grass is a great analogy. So if you cut the grass, it grows back. So it displays this kind of resilience. And no matter how many times you cut it, it always grows back. Um, I think this is, this, is, this is a significant uh, sort of thing because um, it's a way to frame the potential of people and to experience uh, or to, uh, to uh, present resilience. Um, also, I'll add that um, this is the, uh, the grass analogy. Also, I'll add that analogies are also a, a very interesting way to talk about things in the future. So for instance, if a land going sea cucumber doesn't now exist, we can say, well, what if a land going sea cu cucumber was like a, like a camel? Um, we can describe some future state of something that exists now based on some other analogous um, uh, object or entity and describe a future state of something. So this is the grass analogy. The interesting thing about grass is that it will always grow back, no matter how many times you cut it. But it also has requirements, um, requirements for sunlight and water. And so in the case of resilience, what does resilience require? What are the, what are the, the, the requirements for resilience to flourish? This is considered a resilient machine. This is a robot um, that presents its ability and, and 
uh, is able to be resilient because it maps its current state. You know, so it'll map its state, uh, its healthy state when it's not damaged. And it creates this map, this sort of artificial awareness that it uses then to um, understand itself when it gets damaged. So if you know, the users of this thing pull the, pull the arm off, it takes that pre-existing uh, mental image that it has of itself, or this, uh, you know, this, uh, this artificial self-awareness, and it compares its um, previous healthy state to its current damaged state, and uses that information then to invent new ways to, to walk. And so there is video of this um, mapping itself, um, understanding its current state, and then inventing new ways of walking. So does resilience require some level of self-awareness? You know, do we need to map ourselves to understand who we are and our core to understand then how to overcome adversity when we, when we come across it? Iron ore is another interesting example of um, resilience, I think, primarily being a, a journey of something starting out as almost you know, dirt-like, turning in and transforming into something very different. You know, so iron ore exists in the earth. It can be mined. And it's, it's there with latent potential. Um, it's gathered up, uh, melted down. It can be poured into different shapes. You know, it can be beat on really heavily with a hammer in order to create uh, different shapes. You know, sometimes it's plunged into cold water. That cools it down uh, really rapidly and changes its quality. So it goes through this transformation. The actual transformation literally makes the metal harder. And so this process transforms the metal to something hard. So if the metal wants to become a knife, that's good. If the metal wants to be stamped into a uh, uh, a soup can, then that's bad. So what qualities do you want in resilience and what processes can you go through to create those qualities? And ultimately, you know, iron ore out of the earth that looks somewhat like dirt, then looks like this beautiful vase. You know, it can be transformed into a submarine. And the interesting thing here is to talk about resilience in terms of of uh, desired outcome. So if the metal made this journey from iron ore to, to steel um, is, and becomes a submarine, is that the desired outcome you want uh, to achieve? And that's up to everybody's own perception, or that's the, up to everybody to decide. If uh, resilience is a journey and it has a, a destination, what is that destination and how is it defined by each individual? And what is the value of the outcome? And in this case, when metal becomes um, a wedding ring, um, what's the meaning attached to the end result? Death Valley um, is a place that doesn't get a lot of water. It's you know, 100, up to 130 degrees to you know, a national park in California. And it, and it looks like this most of the time. You know, it also looks like this, very arid, very dry. And one year in uh, 2005, one winter it rained about three times as much as it, it usually does. Usually gets two inches of rain. This, this time it got six inches, in, inches of rain, and then boom, you know, this happens, which is, which is pretty amazing. And this is what is said to be like a 50-year cycle, a once-in-a-lifetime event for Death Valley to transform into, you know, to this kind of a thing. And I think the issue as far as resilience is interesting. A couple of things, only one factor changed. So in considering the appropriate manifestation of resilience for this program, if you could change just one thing, what would it be? Um, I think also there's this idea of latency. How long is the right time to wait? Um, these flowers waited 50 years to blossom. Um, is it good to wait 50 years to practice resilience? Is it worth waiting 50 years? Is it worth, worth waiting a lifetime in order to, to, to practice resilience or experience resilience in order to get that, that outcome? Um, so latency is really interesting. And then what single factor might change to encourage, uh, to encourage 
uh, uh, resilience. So I will add a brief description of a graphic that embodies a lot of the study that we undertook to basically summarize graphically what resilience is based on a lot of research from existing data and books and white papers, this sort of thing. Resilience is seen as a two-part construct, and it's seen as a process. It's seen primarily as the movement between victim, survivor, and thriver, and, and, and moving through those different phases, sometimes stopping and going backwards, sometimes never moving forward at all, but it's some movement, some prog progression of victim, survivor, thriver. Um, going from victim to thriver is the act of becoming resilient. Um, what tends to create victim status are risk factors of a whole, a whole variety of risk factors. Racial media bias, um, unhealthy parenting, poverty, um, victim mentality, apathy, acute trauma. Some of these things are controllable, some aren't controllable. On the other end of the spectrum, in the kind of the thriving category, what's required to become uh, resilient are these what's called protection factors, things like creativity, love, spirituality, serendipity, curiosity, um, cultural traditions, social justice, and some of these are controllable, some of these aren't controllable. You know, you, have any, you really don't have any um, uh, control over your cultural heritage, um, but you do have some sort of control over your ability to be creative and um, uh, improve your self-esteem, become more self-aware, differentiate yourself from others. Um, there's also controllable and uncontrollable risk factors such as uh, you can control if you see yourself as a victim, you can control the amount of apathy you sort of practice, um, but you can't control um, your parenting. You can't control uh, racial and media bias or social justice or um, kind of your emotional wiring. And uh, that wraps up what, uh, what we've been talking about as far as analogies and uh, you know, graphical construct of resilience.